more likely to participate in physical activity. There have been some studies that have looked at this and it would be, you know, knowledge of health benefits. So if you know, okay, this is good for me, um, motivation to be healthy and active. Um, so you really want to be healthy. Um, belief that physical activity is fun. So again, like I mentioned with wheelchair basketball, from, for some folks that is, that is their sport and it is really cool. I've, I've helped out um, with medical coverage and uh, with volunteering with it before. It's a really hard sport and it's really amazing. But for me, it wouldn't be the thing that would be for me. So you have to find something that's fun for you. Um, and then access to adaptive physical activity resources. So again, if you live in a state where there aren't any you know, adaptive physical activity or, or sports programs, that is going to be harder. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later, but actually during the pandemic, there's been some online resources that have come out. And I feel like this has actually made access a little bit easier. And I'll share those resources with you guys, um, because I do think that that is super helpful because I know transportation can be um, an issue. And then obviously the, for, during the pandemic, um, most folks are trying to limit how much they're doing outside the house and programs are a little more limited in, in terms of what sports they're doing in person as well. And so then what are the barriers to physical activity participation? So what are the things that make it harder to actually make that step to participate in physical activity or sports? So if you're not motivated, if you're like, I'm just not interested, you don't have time. Um, if you don't have access to transportation, which I know is a big issue, um, especially for wheelchair users. Um, if there's financial stress, so if it costs money to do that and um, it's just not something that you have the means to do at this point, it's totally a barrier. Um, or poor accessibility or access to adaptive resources. So again, like I mentioned, if you don't have many programs that are right around you, then that would make it harder too. So these are all really reasonable barriers um, and real things that um, all of us who kind of help advocate um, for better resources and better participation um, really need to be aware of as we um, try to approach this topic and try to figure out how we can get people to um, so have healthy lifestyles and to participate in sports sports and physical activity that's fun for them. So um, when we actually are talking about para sports, I just wanted to kind of give an example of the summer sports and the winter sports that are currently there for the Paralympic Games. Now again, Paralympic Games elite level, but more of your, your local groups are going to um, essentially be clubs that um, a lot of them are doing the same sports that are in that elite level of Paralympic Games. You might see other things though too, which aren't necessarily Paralympic sports, but are um, adaptive activities such as um, adaptive biking and sailing and other things as well. But these are the official Paralympic summer sports. And these are the official um, Paralympic winter sports. So a smaller list for sure, um, but a lot of really intense um, sports that are present as well. And then para ice hockey is also called sled hockey. It's also called sledge hockey. So you may have heard of that one. And that was the one I mentioned earlier also. So when we actually um, are looking at athletes who are participating in like a competitive para sport activity, um, there's usually what's called a minimum impairment criteria, which is an official list of which um, impairments qualify for the sport. Um, and it is really unique to each sport. So for instance, for wheelchair basketball, so if you were to participate in the Paralympics, wheelchair basketball or high level of um, wheelchair basketball, there's kind of a list of, well, these are the disabilities, these are the impairments that qualify for participating. And the reason why they do it that way is because they really want to kind of level the playing field. Um, so make sure that, you know, it's the, the strongest athlete, um, not the person with the less disability that's going to get the advantage, right? So they really have a, a, um, a clear criteria for this. And like I said, classification really varies um, sport to sport, and it's, it's leveling the playing field. The reason for it is not to try to exclude anyone, but really it's to try to make sure that, you know, team A versus team B are fairly similar so that really, you know, in terms of disabilities, so that when they're playing, it's really the, the, the sport, the game, the ath athletics that um, you're comparing um, in terms of the competition. 
And so when people do classification, so there's actually this whole process that, that um, goes underway where um, people are trained, they go to hours of training um, where they learn to be what's called a classifier. And so a classifier is either usually a physician or, or a physical therapist with a special interest in um, power and adaptive sport. And they, they do an exam, so they, they actually it's kind of like a doctor's visit where they take some history. They say, okay, what kind of um, uh, condition do you have? And what, um, do you take any medications? And how does your spina bifida affect you? Things like that so that they kind of have an understanding of, um, of your diagnosis. And then they do a physical examination so they can see your strength really, um, like really particularly in different muscle groups and range of motion, how much your, your body is flexible in different areas. And then there's a functional examination too. And so I ha- I'm not a classifier. Um, I have shadowed classifiers though at the, um, the veterans games. So the national, um, wheelchair veterans games. Um, and so at those games, when I shadow the classifiers, for instance, the functional examination, now, there were some sports there that were sports that are not um, in the Paralympic games. So for instance, bowling was one of them. And so when we would have somebody come in and they were trying to get classified for bowling, there was actually a bowling ball there and they would demonstrate how they would um, bowl. And so for that, that was also part of the exam um, to kind of look at, okay, how does the spina bifida or, you know, whatever the condition is, how does that affect um, the way this person plays their sport? And so then with all that information, they go ahead and and give the individual a classification score so that they know that they're going to be competing against athletes that are in their same classification level. Or for team sports, um, there's kind of an interesting way that it's done um, where it's, um, it's a certain number in terms of classification on either side of the court. So this is the example of, um, you know, wheelchair basketball uh, classification. So it goes from one to the 4.5. And with one, it's um, individuals who may have less movement at their trunk. Um, and so because of that, they need a higher backrest of their wheelchair. Whereas if somebody got a 4.5, they have full motion at their trunk. So they're able to kind of reach and pass the ball a little bit further out. Um, and so it might be somebody that, for instance, has an amputation of their leg and so their trunk control is not affected. And so what happens is there's five players on each team and there's no more than 14 total points um, on a court at a time. And so um, for the team, so how that, you know, makes it like even on both sides is then you don't have all, all folks that have the ability to move their trunk around more, that'll put them at a, at a different advantage than the other team, right? And so you want to be able to match the, um, the classification on both sides so that, again, when you're, when you're watching the sport, when you're playing the sport, um, when you're, you know, judging or refereeing the sport, um, you're doing it based on the athleticism. You're not doing it based on the disability. So in order to participate in sports, um, for most um, children um, and adolescents, and then also if you're doing more elite sports, you usually want to get an exam done before it. And for a lot of sports, it's actually mandatory. Um, And it's interesting because I think for a lot of the local and, you know, local groups here and throughout the country, local groups that um, occur there isn't necessarily a requirement for a pre-participation exam, although I do recommend it and think that it, it's only going to be something that's going to help you learn a little bit more about your body. Um, and then it, it's a good health check-in. Um, that's a lot of times a prompt for folks to be like, oh yeah, it's a good time to go to the doctor because it's my yearly time for a check-in for this. Um, and so, um, some examples of what things that people might um, ask about are, you know, okay, do you use a walker? Do you use a wheelchair? Do you have um, a history of of bone fractures? Um, Do you need to use um, catheters for your bladder? All things that probably your primary doctor knows a whole lot about. Do you know what you were classified at in the past for your um, parasport? Um, And then that actually helps classifiers too, because then they kind of have a sense of, okay, this is where you were before and see if that's still where you are, because it does get reevaluated. Dietary considerations, if you have any um, uh, uh, hematologic, so like bleeding disorder type conditions, latex allergy, which I know is a big one for, um, for youth with spina bifida. 
um, because some equipment might have latex. And so I think it's important for, um, for people to know about that. Um, and then if you have a seizure history, if you, you know, have a shunt, um, so these are, and if you have, um, trouble feeling um, in, in your skin in certain areas because that may increase your risk of um, pressure sores like we talked about. So again, the reason